Well, the topic of spiritual warfare and demonic possession exorcism is an increasingly significant one for our time. And with me today is a very experienced exorcist and Major League Baseball chaplain. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Gracious gang, it's Mike Creevy from The Gracious Guest Show, here together once again. And uh, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already, so you won't miss any of the content. I've got a lot of great stuff uh, and a lot of great stuff coming, too, that you're definitely going to want to check out. Anything that helps us to deepen in our faith, to consider the intersection of faith and culture more seriously, and to really try to do whatever we can to step back from the kind of day-to-day humdrum and, and uh, the temptations all around us to uh, uh, you know, lose focus, the temptations constantly around us to lose hope even. Um, and with this particular topic, I think it's something that's extremely important for us to uh, consider and also to make sure that we are doing it in a responsible way so as to not um, essentially put demons on some kind of pedestal or, or, or inflate their abilities uh, or on the other extreme uh, downplay or, or not take seriously the threat that they pose. So this is a, a recurring topic now on this channel and uh, I, I really am delighted to share uh, my guest and his story and his insights with all of you. Uh, we are talking today with Monsignor Stephen Rossetti. I have his bio here I'm going to share with you. He's a priest of the Diocese of Syracuse. He graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1973 and then spent six years in the Air Force. After ordination, Monsignor uh, served in two parishes for 18 years. He ministered to priests and religious for their psychological and spiritual healing at St. Luke Institute, eventually becoming its president and CEO. A licensed psychologist, Monsignor Rossetti has a PhD in psychology from Boston College and a Doctor of Ministry degree from the Catholic University of America. He received numerous awards, including an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree from St. Mary's University. Monsignor Rossetti is currently a research associate professor at CUA and the president and founder of St. Michael's Center for Spiritual Renewal. Got that linked below for you. He has been an exorcist for the Archdiocese of Washington for 15 years. He has authored over a dozen books, including his recent work, Priesthood in a Time of Crisis, from Ave Maria Press, When the Lion Roars, Spirit Daily, and the Amazon bestseller, Diary of an American Exorcist, which is a really phenomenal read. Highly recommend it. It's also linked below for you. He can be found on social media, including Instagram, on Monsignor Rossetti, uh, with over 80,000 followers and 7 million views. And sounds like there's a lot more than that, even since he uh, uh, drafted this bio. So um, so I, I know you're going to really enjoy this. He has also been, for the last uh, over 12 years now, the chaplain for the Washington Nationals baseball team. I asked him about that briefly as well. So sit back, enjoy this really incredible uh, chat with Monsignor Steve Rossetti. Check it out. Monsignor Steve Rossetti, thank you so much for joining me on the Gracious Guest Show today. You're welcome, Mike. Great to be with you. It's it's a real honor. I was just telling you off air. This is something I I didn't really uh, ever initially intend to kind of you know get into this this uh, particular topic on a recurring basis, but it's just been something that's really uh, been resonating with with folks. It, it, a lot of questions out there, and uh, maybe just to ask you as far as your own background, just a little briefly here. Uh, how, how did you uh, get into this this exorcism ministry in the first place? Well, it's a strange situation, as I say in the book, uh, yeah. that uh, I, I'm a licensed psychologist, and uh, the, the the archdiocese asked me to look at a case, a possible case, and said, D you know, what's, the, what's your diagnosis? And so I got through with it, and I told the bishop, I said, well, you know, I don't think her problem is psychological. I think she needs an exorcist. And he said, fine. So he asked three different priests uh, to, to do it. And they all said, no. So yeah. the bishop and I were saying, oh, what do we do now? I said, well, I said, give it to me. I said, how hard can it be? <laughs> that was dumb. <laughs> but uh, or the fools rush in where angels spirit of treadmill. So uh, I, that's how I came the extras. Now, I, obviously, I learned how to do uh, and But uh, no one else would do it. Back, this was about 17, 18 years ago. And back yeah. then... There are very few exorcists. No one wanted to do it. And they, and they just, they just were, they just said, you know, not me. Sure. That seems to be, you know, like, and I haven't followed this very closely. Well, I have maybe for like the last 10 years or so, but it, it just seems anecdotally, or whatever, just from my layman's perspective, that it just seems like there's 
far more people interested or inquiring about this or, or um, mm -hmm. it's, it seems like, have I heard correctly that the, the goal at least is to try to get a, a dedicated exorcist priest in each diocese uh, across well, the country? Holy Father or, asks every diocese to have world, one, okay. and I would say around the world, I bet less than a third of them do. Oh, wow. In this okay. country, it's probably half or a little more than half. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if people uh, need help. You know, it is interesting, Mike, as you uh, uh, suggest that this does seem to be a real uh, area of interest for people today. I mean, the number of movies or, or TV shows on ghosts and demons and all that right. stuff has just skyrocketed. Uh, and Absolutely. the number of requests for exorcism has skyrocketed too, by the way. So, I mean, the question comes is why? I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. I think it's a whole armload of reasons why. Um, sure. But uh, but this clearly, uh, it's just uh, uh, boomed. Yeah. Yeah, and I, th I suppose, and one of the questions I just sort of sent you ahead of time that I was wondering about, because it's something that comes up a lot, and I've had students ask this. I, my uh, uh, day job is I, I teach theology in a Catholic high school, and oh, we're actually going to get into in a very general way, I don't go too deep into this, you know, um, I use a lot of tact, you know, but the students ask, um, and, you know, they wonder, and I've wondered myself, how would you describe just for our, our listeners here and viewers, uh, as best we can understand, right, how location in a sense works for, for angels, and of course, by extension, uh, the demons, like, in, in what sense are they here or there, you know, yeah. because obviously the way we understand that could have a, a perhaps a negative yeah. effect or a, or a beneficial well, uh, effect. And, and first of all, Mike, as you mentioned, this young people are interested. I think there's a lot of reasons, some good reasons and not so good reasons. I think there's just sort of this uh, curiosity, which not always is the best thing. Mm. Uh, but I think people today, you know, in the old days, people, you know, your parents passed on the faith. You took it on, you know, faith, as you say, and, and you accepted it. But people don't do that anymore. They want to say, well, you know, prove it to me. Now, we don't prove it, even in exorcism, we don't prove it. Uh, but the reality is, is that there's some, some wild things that happen, which clear, clearly cannot be uh, explained by human means, and they're clearly preternatural. So that uh, these experiences that we go through uh, really point to and support the belief in uh, the, the supernatural. And then when you see things of the Lord... Uh, like holding up a crucifix, you know, mm -hmm. or or uh, invoking the name of Jesus or throwing holy water on and see what it does to this demonic presence. I mean, just torture them. Mm. You, it, it, it supports uh, the faith and say, OK, Jesus is Lord, not Satan. He likes to mm -hmm. think he's Lord, but Jesus is Lord. And you learn and one thing that's the one of the graces of this ministry is that you experience uh, the truths of the faith we and from A to Z. Um, sure. So, yeah, no, it's a uh, dynamic. Now, getting back to your second question, the whole question of the angels, uh, mm -hmm. read St. Thomas. Uh, you're teaching theology. <laughs> By the way, the reason why I did read that particular passage and actually know the answer to your question, what St. Thomas says, <laughs> is because we had someone who was being, uh, uh, it was a possessed person. And then one of our uh, gifted women, a, what we call a spiritual sensor, was another part of the room. And the demons leapt, I mean, leapt off this and then attacked the spiritual uh, person. Hmm. And so they kept doing it. So I was thinking to myself, I'll stand in between the two of them, hold up a crucifix and tell them basically, you know, to stop. Yeah. And well, it turns out that angels don't move from point A to point B. They, they oh, don't yeah. have bodies, you see. So they, right. don't, they don't move through space like from A to B. Uh, they actually don't exist here or there because they don't, they don't have material bodies. There's no right. materiality. They're pure spirits. So what does St. Thomas say? They act in a certain place. So mm. if you say you're possessed, or God forbid, but if you're possessed, the demons don't actually live there per se, right. uh, but they act there. Now, functionally, it's the same thing. You know, it's the mm -hmm. same thing. But but they, that's why, for example, uh, one high-ranking demon can be here, and then a split second can be somewhere else. That's something I, I, I just recently watched. I've been meaning to for a long time. I just recently watched Nefarious because I heard it recommended oh. by a couple folks. And there was something, there's a point in that when, you know, he asks this, you know, the, the, the possessed, possessed person, you know, I forget how he phrases it, but 
the the demon basically says something to the effect of you know i'm here sometimes and sometimes i'm other places yeah. you know but I, I like to be and that that notion that there's this relationship and that's something I, i've i've heard more and more mentioned by, by different exorcists you know talking about the idea that that in, in cases certainly of possession in the extreme but but in these in-between levels of infestation or, or obsession or, or uh, oppression that you have some kind of uh, jur jurisdiction right some sort of relationship has been uh invited you know and and um and is i mean is that is that fair to say as, as far as how to describe right it? well and and so angels will will so they will to be here and then they will ah. just wherever their will takes them and that's why they move move at the speed of thought right uh, so which is important for exorcists to know that you know you're not going to outrun a demon you know and 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 uh, right and actually you know the demons uh, on a on a natural level or preternatural level, they're much stronger than we are. They're intellectually much brighter than we are and much more powerful. So mm -hmm. if it was a, a mano a mano fight between myself and the lowest ranking demon in hell, it'd crush me. But right. they don't crush me. Why? Jesus is Lord. Jesus protects right. me. And that's the key, I think, to this whole ministry and the key to life, frankly. Don't mm -hmm. worry about demons so much. Jesus is Lord. You got Jesus, you're fine. Well, that's so many people. You, like they'll use that line. I think isn't it from The Exorcist that the power of Christ compels you? It's almost like a like a cultural meme. But I'm well, like, that's, and that's they such use a sort powerful. Of, sometimes it's a joke, like the power. Right. Of Christ. But, that that is the reality. But it's, <laughs> right. It really. <laughs> yeah. It's, yes, and they yeah. they mock the church, but I think right. demons know better. When you hold up a right. crucifix uh, and say yeah. "Ece crucem Domini." Food mm. and parted. I'll show you my crucifix. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, I got this great crucifix, by the way. So when you hold the crucifix, Ece, Crucem yeah. Domini, I say, to, behold the cross of the Lord. I say, look at the sign of your defeat. Look at the sign of your defeat. They can't stand yeah. it. And then, yeah. by the way, the back of this crucifix, they're all first class relics of saints. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So it's a, I was I was going to ask that was another question I was going to ask you so I mean uh, maybe we don't have time to talk about all of them maybe we I don't know but just for relics this is something um, I've been increasingly curious about about the like you said before the maybe you don't use the word proof in a scientific sense but the the the, the evidence the direct experience of the teachings of the church uh, these relics uh, and their power uh, would you mind sharing maybe an example or two oh, of I had a possessed person I took one of the yeah. relics I didn't show it to the person. Right. Put it on the back of the person. I say, in Jesus' name, who is it? Wow. And they, and they said, uh, it's Peter. Yeah, it was a, it was a mm. relic. Say Peter, whatever. So I, they 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 correctly identified what relic wow. it was. You know, <laughs> or they, although they usually say something like, like if it's Padre Appeal, they'll say, oh that old guy. You know, they'll, yeah. they'll diss the person. That old guy. Yeah. Used to call him that old. Yeah, they always call him this old guy. Yeah. So. Uh, no, the relics are part, because it's not that the bone means anything. You're invoking the saint, right? And and I would say to each person here, first of all, your name is Mike Michael. Mm -hmm. You have a special connection to the archangel. Yes. Use it now. If you had yeah. a demonic problem, God forbid. But if you did, we would invoke Saint Michael especially for you, and he would sure. he would hear it and listen. Now he always does, of course. But for you, there's a special connection. And yeah. I would say with each person. Uh, your namesake is is uh, is a there's a bond there, so that's why we don't call people these non saint names because you know there's no saint. And also, God forbid, some people name their kids after demons. I mean, Lilith and yeah. Lucifer. You go, whoa! I mean, you, right. you know, what a way to start your life. So those uh, your name is important, and also in your confirmation name, of course. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, but but also. Uh, if you have a particular devotion, like do you have a saint you have a particular devotion to that you really kind of? Yeah, there's there's a couple. The one that uh, Saint Jose Maria comes to mind. Okay, you know. Well, yeah. see, here's what happened. Now, if, when we were praying over you, we would call on, you know, Saint Jose Maria, mm -hmm. because many times we think, well, I pick this particular saint. Actually, usually it's God who picks the saint for you. And says this right. is this is this is who I've got for you, Mike. Yeah. And and so there's a, another a bond there too. So we invoke all the saints, especially those like St. Joseph and all the powerful sure. saints, but then the particular saint that's connected to you. That's and this, I'm so glad you brought this up because I was I was going to ask you, you know, just in your own life. Uh, so 
who I, I don't know who your patron saint is, but do do you invoke your own patron saint on occasions in 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 this sure, ministry? Sure. I'm I'm a big fan because I love Padre Pio and John yeah. Paul too. Right. And uh, uh, of course, the famous, you know, Saint Joseph, whatever. And of course, the Virgin Mary, by the by, you know, just mm-hmm. in the whole class by herself. But in terms of saints, I have a particular devotion to uh, Saint Gemma Galgani, and I oh, okay. actually, yeah, uh, this is a piece of her of her bone in here. Wow. This uh, one saint's piece of her bone. But I wow. also have a little piece of her heart. Wow. Yes, I know oh, the wow. priest who. Uh, it was, uh, oh, I bet they of, hate that. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and char- I know the priest who actually is in charge of her relics. Wow. So wow. Um, he volunteered. He said, I go there often, actually, in Lucca in Italy. Okay. And he said, uh, I'll give you a piece of her heart. Wow. So, That's uh, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm pretty excited about it. I've got it. And I, you know. <laughs> That's just the, the fascinating, and again, this is something, you know, that, that I find young people, you know, as challenging as it is, you know, for us to teach the faith and, and for us to, to get a receptive audience, things like this, um, I find that they just, it's so interesting to them or so, you know, I don't want to say not, not morbid, but just, it's so ma- almost macabre, like from the worldly perspective, like they just, yeah. you know, wow, that's like a piece of a saint's bone. That's so cool. But, but then to go deeper and say that, well, this, this is also, um, a form of evidence or an invitation to go deeper into our belief about the resurrection of the body, yeah. you know, that this, yeah, their body has not yet been resurrected, but they're still connected in this special way. And they're not, an we're imprint. not using these like superstitiously, you know, these are no, not like no. magical. You know, it's, it's a, it's a prayer. It's an invocation yes. of a saint. And yeah. uh, it, it really shows the importance of the sacramental, not the seven sacraments. Then there's a the sacramentals like mm-hmm. relics and holy water and crucifixes or whatever. It shows we, we it shows the power of them when you're just when you're in an exorcism and you're throwing some holy water on there you're holding up a crucifix you're using the relics of the saints and on all and the benedictine cross i mean these mm. things are very powerful the demons they hate them they go scream yeah. and howl and matter of fact one the, the toughest exorcism i ever had lucifer himself was present and usually he isn't by the way himself yeah uh, but sometimes they'll send minions but this he wow. was uh, himself and we got it finally it came down to the end and he was the last one left of course and uh i held up the crucifix through holy water he screamed just like the rest of them and mm-hmm. one of the old one of the priests well uh, in the room was just so so edified and and uh, surprised and mm-hmm. lucifer himself would be screaming with a little bit of holy water through him. why why because it, it it it's something holy and yeah. demons are have Given themselves to evil, and they're blacker than black. Yeah. It's just, just there's no water in hell. There's no light in hell. It is yeah. just this dark, uh, evil thing. And so, a little bit of water, a little bit of holy water, a little Purity. piece yeah. of holiness. Yeah, it, it's it causes them so, and, and incredible torture. Yeah, which is well, why it, they, it, car- it carries the prayer of, of you know the church. You know, and, and well, it's, it's a piece it's, of God in some ways. I mean, yeah. they, they use that expression. It, it's sure. it's a reflection. It's sort of a a piece of God's grace, and they have sure. rejected that. Which is why, by the way, this is going to sound strange, but that hell is a grace. You hmm. say, well, that's a dumb idea. No, actually, it's not. Because if you took, imagine the demons when you throw a little holy water on them, how much they scream. Now imagine taking those demons and putting them into God's presence. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be a uh, suffering that would be a uh, cruel. Mm-hmm. And so God allows them to be away from him because they can't stand his presence. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's, and it's just, it's amazing. Like the power, like you said, you know, this, this whole reality of the power of, of Christ himself and, and his desire to share right through, like he doesn't have to, mm-hmm. you know, employ the family and the, the way that he does, but in, in his love that he wants to do that. And I, for me, one of the most chilling back to the movie, just for a second with nefarious, one of the things that stood out to me with that was, it was so chilling when they brought in the, that chaplain, you know, they bring in the priest and the, the, the demon gets at first all upset and nervous. And just to see gradually as that short scene plays out where, you know, he slowly realizes that this particular priest doesn't believe, you know, doesn't, but it's, Oh, we're past all that. It's all psychology. And I wanted to ask you you with, you know, and father Zeta, I asked this as well. um, And I've heard more and more priests in this ministry uh, trying to, to, you know, be more equipped to, to look at some of those, those, um, I don't want to say merely psychological issues. Cause I think it's where we're psychosomatic, of course, but, um, 
how 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 has that worked out? I guess in your own ministry, that balance of, of you know your expertise in in psychology then and also the spiritual side mm-hmm. of this. Uh, what's yeah, what's that uh, look like? By the way, the movie of Nefarious. Yeah. That's the only movie I know that exorcists really recommend. I have that's, four that's exorcists <laughs> coming. They like the movie, and yeah. so I watched it, and it was good. Uh, they really did capture that demonic presence, you know, the and, psychology and the yeah, the, the psychology you know. of the demonic, which is you know ugly. Uh, yeah. So yeah, they did a good job of that. So it's it's worth watching if you're if you're feeling feeling secure and balanced. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's but, not pleasant by any means. But the, the interaction of the psychological and spiritual, uh, typically. There's lots of uh, possibilities. One is that the person's problem is just psychological. Now, mm-hmm. that's true often of people who are psychotic, who have uh, are bipolar or mm-hmm. certain forms of autism. They'll think they have demons, but they don't. They say, oh, I've got demons. I know, no, you don't. Right. Actually, you have a psychosis. And, right. and so we have to be careful about that. Uh, there are other people whose problems are just uh, uh, of the spiritual and just demonic. And we know that when you pray over the people and their psychological problems disappear. For example, mm. there was a, a woman who was uh, uh, cutting herself and borderline personality disorder and quite, quite disturbed. Mm. And uh, the exorcist I know prayed over her and it, it lifted. I mean, it just disappeared. Mm. Now, but what usually is the case is there an inc- is there intermingling of that? What happens is that, that, that Many of those who are people who are possessed or oppressed have psychological wounds, and sure. the demons take advantage of those psychological wounds and then exacerbate them. So what we do when we treat people is we not only cast out the demons, but we also have them address the psychological wounds, typically in, in unbound or in psychotherapy or some sort sure. of healing process, so it doesn't give the demons anything to grab onto. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. I imagine that you know with some of the what, what often referred to, you know, the doorways, which, right. uh, which can, you know, I, I, there's behave certain, you know, behavioral things or like, you know, Ouija boards, occult, you know, these sorts of things that you hear about, of course, but I imagine that, that, that is, you know, and I think you've mentioned this perhaps in your book too, that there does seem to be patterns, uh, sometimes with, with, uh, different abuse or, or, or things like that. And again, not a guarantee or if you've ever been, yeah. Well, you know, a victim it, of something it, like that, you're going to have demons, but that there can be these, these weak. Well, points. typically what are we, I mean, it's all, every case is different. But sure. for those who are severely oppressed or possessed, oftentimes there's a combination of stuff. There may be a combination of underlying wounds, and then the person dabbling in the occult, or there's a lot of cursing going on, or the family's into a, uh, the occult, or a lot of drug or uh, other types of sinful behaviors. So you add up wounds and sinful behaviors and occult practices, you mix them all together, and you end up with a sure. pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, distressed package. I don't, I didn't mention this ahead of time, you know, that I would ask you, but I'm, now I'm just wondering is in your own experience, at least, you know, is there a, a particular aspect of, of, of human life or our culture right now that you would say seems to be the, the biggest kind of doorway, you know, is it a well, cult, is, what, it, is, it, say, is it sexual what... licenses, you know? Yeah. Here's my cocktail for getting possessed. I don't, I don't suggest you drink <laughs> three, three easy steps getting possessed. Yeah. One, stop practicing the faith. The faith is your shield, as Ephesians 6 says. Jesus, yeah. the faith is your shield that protects you. So drop your sure. shield. Two, start committing serious sins. That mm-hmm. opens, you know, the, the, the whatever self, the demonic. And then three, do something with the occult. Start playing with a Ouija board. Start doing mm-hmm. carol cards, summoning mm-hmm. the dead, uh, 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 automatic writing, uh, uh, anything like that. So sure. add the three of them together. You do it long enough. And you're you're going to have a problem, yeah. Uh, and and uh, the the danger of that all that is that's what people are doing today. Sure, I mean, people are not practicing the faith. They are committing some serious sins, and that the number of people today, especially sadly young women, but men too, who are practicing witchcraft and the occult is huge. Sure, and they think, well, what's wrong with it? I tell you, what's wrong with it? You, it's an opening to the demonic. People don't believe that. Say, I had someone recently yeah. say, oh. I use tarot cards, but it's not open demonic. I'm I'm channeling the divine within. Really? Did Jesus say, "Well, blessed are those who use tarot cards"? Yeah. No. I mean, you're asking, you're 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 moving into an occult uh, practice, which is not gospel. Sure. And and the divine divine within that's that's what Satanists say. 
that I'm God, you know, and, and right. uh, so it's, it's. Trouble. Well, and this idea of like you're meddling with with stuff you couldn't possibly understand or or, or fathom, and because I'm reminded of the uh, one thing I've always thought really interesting about that episode. I think it's First Samuel, uh, where Saul you know, or you know, was attempting to to use the witch of Endor to summon yeah. uh, the prophet Samuel, who's died. Yeah, yeah. And what's what's amazing about that story? Sometimes you, have, I wonder if you know, sometimes people miss this point. Is that it's it's not that it's wrong because it's nonsense. You know, like, because it works, you know, I mean? like she, like she actually, like there is this, this contact is made. And Samuel, of course, rebukes Saul for, for doing this gravely sinful thing uh, to contact. And and so I, I've often wondered about that, you know, that it's in curses, of course, like people will just be very dismissive and oh, that's, that's a bunch of hooey, you know. Um, but you gave a couple examples in the book I thought were pretty spectacularly yeah. Just chilling and, and real, right? About the uh, the power, even generationally, of, of of curses. How often do you run into to those like generational curses of some often, kind? Very often. Yeah. And I and we, I've just learned this in the ministry that uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's easy to say, well, that curses, but I did. I've had people tell me that, you know. But and it's true that sort of low level people, you know, playing games with curses and stuff, right. may may or may not. It could be effective but it, but it, probably more so than you realize but certainly in the higher levels of, of proficient witches uh throwing curses and hexes they're very i've got a couple i've got two cases right now of people being uh, completely mm. cursed a uh, three actually now yeah and uh sadly these guys had sex with a witch mm. uh and and also the woman had a sex with a with a sorcerer and mm. made the person mad and they're hexing them and cursing them and you wouldn't believe the things that happen uh, to these people. So the, uh, I learned, you know, through my ministry that curses are real. Why? Not because the person has any power of their own, but because they, they're they enlisting demons. Yeah. And which you say, no, I'm not. Yeah, you are. You're enlisting demons. You don't realize it. But right. you're enlisting demons. And so what can a witch do? A witch can do anything a demon can do. Because mm. of the power of demons that they're in, uh, invoking. Hmm. It's almost like the, it, it strikes me as the the kind of mockery or the inverse. Like much, much how possession itself seems to be this this mo- attempt to kind of mock the incarnation. I've heard it described, right. which I find really in- intriguing, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but it almost seems like the, the the cursing, these incantations, it's it's like this uh, this this reverse of the power of the word. <laughs> well, you're right. In the, in the occult and in Satanism and witchcraft, there, there are all these, uh, what we call the satanic inversions. You mm-hmm. take holy things and you flip them. Rather, rather than a mass, you end up with a black mass. Right. Rather than, uh, rather than it's interesting, by the way, they always take a, a host, a Eucharist, a real host from a Catholic yes. church. Yes. They don't take yeah. them from another, no, they take them from Catholic churches. Right. Yeah. Right. And, or sacramentals. We have holy water, they have like moon water or whatever. So, mm-hmm. They, they take what and, and twist it. Uh, yeah, people don't realize that they're they're dabbling in uh, some pretty ugly, powerful stuff. And and whenever you do that, one reformed uh, witch told me, whenever he in, uh, cursed someone or or did a uh, a hex or whatever, that you're actually implicitly making a contract with Satan, whether you whether you would think so or not. Mm. You're making a contract with Satan. Well, and and kind of along those lines, right? I was I was going to ask you, you know, it, it's and I'm always ca- trying to be cautious about this, um, and I I feel pretty pretty safe in terms of my own kind of where I'm at with this. But I certainly think you know to to students who will ask these kinds of things, like I, I've said a few times now, I'm always thinking about how to uh, address like when they ask about uh, potential examples and you give some in the book i thought you know would, would you mind you know sharing just a few examples of you know, some of the in, in terms of manifestations not to glorify or, or or create some you know just oh wow that's really creepy but just as any you know some examples of things that really gave you in the room a very confident sense that you know this is something that is is you know way beyond just a, a, yeah, a, I don't a psychotic episode or something yeah i don't do much of that because that's what yeah you know, people say i want you to prove it to me Look at it. Right. Yeah, no, look at yeah. But I would say, I mean, lots of wild things happen. People do actually have had people levitate. I mean, we, right. we had things fly across the room, whatever, you know, things like that. So those things do happen. 
and uh, but they're demonic antics. We right. don't. Uh, we don't. Uh, people say, "What do I do? What do I do?" I say, "Well, just put it back." You know, I mean, don't, don't, they're just trying <laughs> to scare you. You know, that's the, a good, the yeah. demons. Uh, people say, "Well, they're going to kill." No, no, demons are not going to kill you. God does right. not let demons kill people. He can tempt you. Mm -hmm. uh, he can tempt his people, but he doesn't allow them. So, uh, your uh, practice of faith, you're protected. Mm -hmm. Demons can harass you a little bit. Uh, yeah. Sure, they can. They harass Padre Pio and Saint sure. Gemma and all the great saints. Yeah. But in in the long run, you're protected, and so don't don't sure. let these demonic twelve year old antics, so things they, they act like little kids. And that's that was probably the one of the the main questions I really wanted to to ask you because I got that sense reading your book and listen, like I said, listening to some of the other things I've been researching and and, and reading. Um, and it what really comes across to me a lot is for all the you know the fear like you said all the antics all the the movie type stuff that that gets out there um one of the reasons that i appreciated something i thought they did really well again in in nefarious which was pretty unique i thought was to really focus in on this uh, this this reality of this warped good like this thing that was supposed to be good this thing that was supposed right. to be beautiful that was supposed to be dedicated to some unique purpose in god's will has completely caved in on itself Mm -hmm. Um, and so what are, you know, I guess just maybe some of the, the key, uh, I don't, I don't know if I want to say personality features that, that seems to be pretty common is, is in terms of the demons themselves and, you know, anger, mm -hmm. resentment, well, you know, Satan himself and the rest of our reflections of him. Mm -hmm. I mean, demons are basically completely self-centered. Okay. So yes. Yeah. And they're malign what we call malignant narcissists. Right. They're also sociopaths. They have no sense of, of right or wrong. And uh, uh, only, you know, what I like and I don't like and what I want to, you know, it's what makes me happy or sort of and unhappy. And which is why oftentimes you want to get the demons to stop doing something. You're never going to appeal to their higher purpose because they don't have a higher purpose. Mm. But as I tell, it's like a dog, smack them on the nose. <laughs> like, for example, the demons yeah. kept doing some bad thing. And I said, look, in the session, I said, every time you do that, I'm going to hit you with holy water. So they kept doing it. Yeah. I sprinkled the holy water. They kept yeah. doing it. I smacked the holy water. They kept doing it. Finally, they stopped because they realized that every time they're going to do that, I'm going to hit them with holy water and they're going to right. suffer. So that's how you train a, a, a yeah. dog. Or Although I love dogs, frankly. Uh, but, yeah. uh, one time the, the demon said to me, you're treating me like a dog. And I said, let me tell you something. I love dogs. I yeah. would never compare you to a dog because dogs are, they're kind. Yeah. They're obedient. They're loving, right. and you are none of those things. You don't deserve the word, <laughs> right? Dog. So they have oh. shut them up. <laughs> it's it's just it, it's so. Uh, and again, not to feel not to feel sorry f for demons, but 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 to, I mean, from this, it, what really strikes me is this sense of just the the incredible reality of of what this thing gave up, and mm. and how it's it's just this. I've I've described it before. I want to see if you think this is a fair description. I've described it before to students. I said it. Um, just the sheer, you know, the sheer power, the sheer reality of what this thing is, like its capabilities, all that. I said, if, how many of you guys have been to like a ski lodge or something where there's a, with a huge fireplace in the lobby with this giant roaring fire in this beautiful fireplace? And like some hands go up. I said, you know, within that context, it's this amazing, beautiful, dynamic thing. It's it's right where it's supposed to be. But if you, you know, throw some of the logs out onto the carpet, you know, you completely take it outside of the context of mm -hmm. what it was meant to be. It's just a destructive, uncontrolled force. Um, and so that that's sometimes is an image I've, I've had of it before that this, you know, it's, uh, you know, that well, you, uh, here's another it's, de reason. it's detached from, from, you know, any commitment, any love. It's just sheer will, sheer intellect. Yeah. Well, that's why like, there's no love in hell. And yeah. so, or no friendship either. People say, well, I'm going to go to hell and beat my friends. And, no, and there's no yeah, friendship friend. in hell and no connection in hell. But one of the reasons why angels, angels who are now demons, try to possess people is that angels were meant for connection, like just like we are. We're meant to be connected. And, but they, 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 can't, they can't love and they, they can't love you like your, like your guardian angel does. So mm. to make that connection, they try to control you know, it's, it's like uh, those unhealthy relationships when people get in, they, they can't love each other freely. They had, uh, well, there was a phrase, there was a, a TV series on it, sort of a, a bad connection, you know, of mm. relationships. Uh, so that's that's all they can do. They they can't love, they can't 
Um, but what do they gave up? The, as uh, Sister Faustina said, the number one, of course, the church says this too, the number one suffering in hell is to give up the vision of God, uh, the, the greatest good. And you, it's not just a demon. You see, the people today, they stop practicing the faith. They start get, dabbling in the occult. They give up a loving relation with the Lord and all the joy and peace that he gives. Mm-hmm. And, and they become, say, I'm not going to serve. Non serviana, demons would say. Well, you end up serving Satan. And mm-hmm. which would you rather be? Uh, serving the Lord in love and peace? Or serving a malignant sociopathic narcissist who will beat you up and, and, and think it's fun. So it's amazing that the, the demons would not serve the Lord, but yeah. instead they're slaves. In one case, slaves of Satan. one case, there was a high-ranking demon there. And uh, the famous case a few hundred years ago. And the, uh, and the bishop was doing the exorcism. And he, he, command, he said, uh, I want these lower demons to, to, to come forward and speak. And uh, the, the head demon said, absolutely not. These are my slaves and dogs. He said, oh, they're not mm. going to speak. You know, I'm the ones in charge. Mm-hmm. You, know, you gave up mm. a loving relationship with the Lord to be treated like a slave and a dog. And that's what a lot of people are doing today when they yeah. protect their faith. It's uh, well, and I, I, I laugh a little bit because like the narcissism thing, like you mentioned, I think, remember uh, at one point in the book where you mentioned uh, a pretty high ranking demon who was really hung up on your pronunciation, like actually hung up on the pronunciation of his name. I mean, no, it was amazing. It just, <laughs> and you know, I just screaming and being thrown out and it's yeah. Baal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so by the way, you now I know how right. to pronounce the name. Anyway, yeah. you're in the sacristy, you say, no, is it Baal or Baal? No, it's yeah. Baal. You know, so uh, That's yeah, something. no, it's it's bizarre. I mean, the, the the what goes through demons' minds is just it's incredibly, actually stupid. Yeah, uh, they're they're like a supercomputer <coughs> with bad software. Well, you know? and a lot of like you know your descriptions reminded me. I, I love C.S. Lewis, and I love in his uh, uh, Ransom trilogy. Have you read those? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, but I love in in uh, the second one where he's dealing basically with the the possessed guy. And uh, he has that whole little vignette where, you know, he's he's doing what he can to try to, like, intellectually argue with this this creature. And it's beating him at every turn. It's 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 mopping the floor with him because it's so much more intellectually powerful than him. But then when he encounters it in the woods off hours, so to speak, it's just ripping frogs apart. Hmm. And he, he has this beautiful description. Well, it's it's terrifying. But that beautiful description of this idea that here's this creature that's basically inside out. That all of its you know grandeur and big plans and all that is basically the surface level show, and deep down at its core, it's just petty and completely yeah. self absorbed. Well, no, I haven't consuming. read those. I, I read a bunch of C.S. Lewis, but that sounds interesting. But it I'll have to I'll, accurate. Yeah, I'll have to send you that the, the, that section at least. I thought it was really well, sound. When you read C.S. Yeah. Lewis's the, the, the screw tape letters, and you also yes. read some of yeah. his stories about uh, about souls passing on to the next life, whatever. Mm-hmm. Very powerful, and I think you made, makes you think he had a real insight into into yeah. the spiritual realities. But yeah. yeah, demons are incredibly boring. There's no creativity in hell, and the messages yeah. are always the same. Let me tell you that the, about the five or six messages you're going to hear from demons, sure. with those who are whatever. There's no hope for you. You're a miserable person. You know, uh, God doesn't care about you. Mm-hmm. Your sins are too bad to be forgiven, and wow. You're abandoned and you're going to go to hell and you might as well commit suicide. Hmm. Those are the messages constant. That's all. That's all they got. Yeah. That's all. That's that's all they say to people. And God forbid you go to hell. That's what you're going to hear for eternity. Hmm. And it, but if you go to heaven, Jesus is going to say, I love you. Mm-hmm. Your sins are forgiven and welcome into your into your father's joy. I think it was Fulton Sheen who 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 has pointed out. I'm sure others have as well. But the, the wide uh, variety, right, of, of the saints, you know, and then you've got St. Jerome, you've got St. Augustine, you've got like all these different personalities, this this huge creative array, you know, and like a stained glass window, but the great tyrants and the demons of ultimate, you know, it's, it's the same, the same thing over and over, just in different uniforms or different, boring. you know, there's no boring, creativity boring. there. Yeah, no worries. That's the great it, lie. Yeah, <laughs> it's completely boring. Oh. Well, I know, Monsignor, I, I know you got to run here. I have one last question for you, completely unrelated. I've just had to ask, what's it like being a Major League Baseball chaplain? <laughs> what's your yeah, favorite well, part? The 2019 uh, yeah. uh, World Series, it was unbelievable. <laughs> so uh, well, the, the nice thing about it is you get to know the players and, the, and their families and, and the yeah. staff. And 
So you get the when the guy steps up at the plate and you know, and uh, you get yeah. I know him and, uh, <laughs> and so it's yeah. nice to to know the people in the stadium. It's a girl, it's like a little parish, sure. You know, and they're, they're great guys and they're human beings and doing their best and you know so it's a it's a it's a it's a joyful ministry. I guess if there's a disputed call, you might, you might be tempted to take it personally, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I say my, my job really is, uh, especially when they have a bad night. And when, as yeah. when, when the guy goes over four at the plate, uh, I just, I'm there uh, to say, you know, God still loves you. So, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, win or lose, the yeah. Lord is still love you. So that's all we ask you to just do your yeah. best. Well, Monsignor, thank thank you so much for a lot of reasons. As as a veteran myself, thank you for your service, you know, and, and also thank you for your, you know, most importantly, your service to our Lord and this ministry. And uh, like I said, I'll make sure the links, you know, the website and everything's below. People can, you know. How about if I say a prayer follows. over you all? Oh, please do. Yes, please. Yeah. So th- send the link to our website. We will do, yeah. CatholicExorcism.org. And, and every month we have an online deliverance session. Yeah. And uh, one is Monday, this Monday, but uh, once a month. And we have about 15,000 people sign up. Wonderful. Oh, good. It's amazing. And our, our social media has just exploded. It's just, mm. we, uh, we've we had over 10 million views in a year. Wow. And uh, it's every time we do, I do a short little three to five minute video, uh, I, either on Instagram or TikTok or mm-hmm. X or t- whatever those things are, Facebook, whatever. I have somebody else do my, I'm, I'm a little, right. he but I do the videos and three to five minutes and these pray with me videos, we get easily yeah. over a hundred thousand views for each one. So Wonderful. there really is a thirst out there for, for prayer and for things of the Lord. So sure. It's, it's been Good. a joy. Yeah. Yeah, well, let, so let's, let's pray now, please. Yep. I first like to ask our blessed mother to spread a mantle over each and every person. I ask the holy angel, the powers of heaven, to protect you all, protect your ministry, Mike, and all of our people here listening. We ask that the blood of Jesus wash over each and every person. May the blood of Jesus wash over your mind, healing, your heart, healing. Bring a deep, deep sense of peace. Lord, you promised us your joy and your peace. I pray now that your joy and peace might touch each person who are listening and all the loved ones. May mighty God bless you and heal you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace. Thank you so much, Monsignor. I really appreciate it. And uh, God bless you and your ministry. Thanks. What an amazing uh, opportunity here to hear from Monsignor. Uh, really insightful. Uh, I, I really just am delighted to be able to uh, to talk with him uh, and to share you know these different conversations with different exorcists, uh, all of whom have their own unique experiences. But we see, uh, I'm seeing more and more as I've, I conduct a lot of these these interviews, more and more uh, of uh, crossover, a lot of shared experience, a lot of uh, shared insight that I'm finding personally beneficial in my own spiritual life, in my own prayer, uh, in my own confidence in the power of Christ to conquer all things which he has already done, and that we uh, are now in a position of, uh, you know, really being challenged, I think, to open ourselves more to receiving that grace and that protection, uh, and not putting ourselves at risk. It's just, uh, it, it's not the path we should go, you know. So thank you all so much. Uh, again, uh, I, I typically have comments turned off on these videos just for a number of reasons, but if you need to uh, reach out to, to, to me for any reason you want to get in touch, uh, feel free to do so through my website, which is linked below as always. And like I said, check out all the links Monsignor Rossetti shared with us as well. Until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care. <laughs>